This is week uh, four in a conversation that we've been having, having in our sermon series entitled Awaken to Your Goodness, to Your God, and to Your Life. Uh, last week, I just need to say this about last week's sermon. Uh, if you weren't here last week, that's totally okay. If you haven't heard last week's sermon, you got to go back and listen to it. It changes everything. What a gift it is to have Danielle Schroyer uh, on staff with us for the next six months as our uh, scholar in residence. Her sermon on who Jesus the Christ is and has been in our life, I have to tell you, I've been thinking about it all week. It's been challenging uh, my assumptions that I've held uh, for my entire life, but it's also been inviting me into deeper and fuller expressions of God's love. And uh, if you haven't listened to it, go back on our website and listen to it today. Um, today we are, like I said at the very top of the hour, going to examine this notion of original sin. It's something that we have carried around with us in one form or fashion our entire lives. We're going to talk about uh, what it is, where it came from, why it's here, and who it points God to be and who it points us to be. We're going to uh, mirror that refrain throughout our entire uh, sermon lesson this morning. And our scripture lesson is going to come in the middle of that. So, friends, as we prepare to hear the word read and proclaimed, listen now for the word of the Lord, and may, us, may we attune our hearts and minds to what Spirit is saying to us. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, awaken us to your spirit that hovers here. Your spirit that hovers here in Founders Hall, just as she hovered over the waters of creation. Reach across the ages and breathe new life into these ancient words that they would be your word to us here and now. Breathe new life, O God, into the words of my mouth and into the meditations of all of our hearts that all would be acceptable and pleasing to you, O God, for you are our rock and you are our redeemer, for we pray in Christ's holy name, amen. When I was a kid, I must have been almost 10 years old when I was taught how to do laundry. In our house uh, growing up, uh, I was taught to do laundry in this way. Before you could do the laundry, you had to sort the laundry. In our house back in the day, you had to sort all the white clothes um, from all of the darker colored clothes. So when you uh, got all the white clothes, you made a big pile. And then you took uh, sort of the in-between colors, your browns and your beiges, and you made a, 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 middle, a middle pile. And then you took like your reds and your dark blues and your blacks, and you made a third pile of those clothes. The rule in our house was you couldn't wash all the clothes together. I knew what the rules were. I was taught those rules. And so one day I... Uh, took all the white clothes and I put them in the washing machine and I, uh, you know, I did the dial and um, it went, <laughs> then I pulled it out, all the water came in, I put the uh, soap in there, closed the lid, didn't think anything of it until there was like that buzzer. Uh, remember when um, washing machines used to have the buzzer, like a scoreboard at a basketball game? It would go, not like it wouldn't play musical tones for you. Well, the went off and I went uh, to the washing machine top loader. I opened it and I looked in and I thought, wait a second. And I thought it was just the hallway light. So I uh, turned on the light that was in the um, closet where our washer and dryer were. And I looked in and I thought, uh-oh. Um, all of the clothes that I had sorted to be white were now pink. And I thought, what has happened? So I called for backup. Mom! Mom came in, and she looked in, and she goes, uh-oh. And I said, I promise, I sorted all of the white clothes. She goes, something happened. And we started pulling out all of uh, the once white clothes that were now pink clothes, and we found the culprit. It was a, a neon pink sock. It was my sister's. It wasn't her fault. It just got tied up with the white laundry, and now all of our clothes were pink. For the next week, we tried everything to get those now uh, white pink clothes actually white again. I mean, we tried baking soda. We tried baking soda with vinegar, you know, so that it would bubble. We let them soak. We then tried bleach, and no matter what we did, those once white clothes 
were forever and always, they always had a pink hue to them. The doctrine of original sin has been our pink sock in the Reformed tradition. It is permanent press and it don't wash out. No matter um, how many loads of laundry we do, no matter how many uh, Bible studies we do, the doctrine of original sin is been there. It's our starting point. It colors the way that we see our faith, ourselves, and Scripture. I'm not necessarily saying it's wrong, but I am saying that we need uh, to get in relationship with how it has tinted our faith and who we believe God to be. So what is the doctrine of original sin? Uh, The doctrine of original sin is um, this understanding that we were born flawed, broken, sinful, and in need of God's grace. Um, You can look for uh, many different definitions of original sin, but that's a pretty good one. But where did it come from? Turns out, uh, for the first 400 years, the first uh, four centuries of the Christian faith, followers of the way did not have a notion of original sin. When you go back and look at our oldest creeds, uh, our two oldest creeds, the Apostles' Creed, which was used uh, around Easter for the rite of baptism, it says nothing about, and we believe we are terrible humans in need of your grace, O God. It doesn't say that. The Nicene Creed, which follows the Apostles' Creed, uh, second oldest creed that we have, does not have a notion of original sin. So where does the doctrine of original sin come from? It comes from uh, St. Augustine. I asked Mark today um, if they read this at Princeton. When I was in seminary, St. Augustine, this very book was the very first book we read in Reformed theology. Augustine introduces us to the doctrine of original sin. Several snippets from Augustine. Augustine uh, tells the story of when he was just a little kid, maybe like eight years old. And he remembers that he and a group of his friends went one day and stole pears from the market. They weren't hungry. They didn't uh, not have money to be able to pay for those pears. They stole those pears because they just wanted to push boundaries. They wanted to do something that felt tricky. And he said, even then, as a child, I was, to quote him, rotten from my core. And Augustine then goes on and he outlines every season of his life. And Augustine, let's just say this, sounds like a boring name. Boring name, this guy had a lot of fun. And he writes, his prayer was this, oh God, you got to see this. Make me good, but not yet. Right? This is a person who is having so much fun. Make me good, oh God. I'm rotten from my core, but not yet. Uh, Augustine's doctrine of original sin then gets passed down, and we get to Luther, right? And Luther says, uh, even in baptism as infants, we show up in a guilty state. And baptism doesn't even reverse that guilty state. We are fully dependent upon God. Then we get to John Calvin. If you're Presbyterian, you know John Calvin. And Calvin gives us an entire doctrine of original sin, tulip. How many of you remember tulip from, uh, yeah? Cool, three of us. Four. Thank you, Chad, for jumping in. Four of us, and some of you are like, wait, tulip, what does this mean? He gives us a systemized doctrine of original sin. You ready for this? Tulip, and an acronym that stands for total depravity. Uh, friends, if it feels good, if it brings you joy, do not do it. That sounds like a lot of fun, right? Sort of the opposite of Augustine. Uh, then, look at this, unconditional election. God chooses who God elects, and upon that election, that will never change. Limited atonement. This notion of Jesus' death to atone for our sins is meant for this half of the room, but not for this half of the room. We're all shaking our heads as if, yeah, 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 we're on board with that. The problem is, who decides? How do we know? Who's in, who's out? Uh, 
irresistible grace, the only way that we will come to know the love of God is that grace has been given to us and it's so irresistible that no one could say no to it. And then perseverance of the saints. That uh, once you have been elected, once that you have been uh, part of the elect, you will always and forever be the elect. The doctrine of original sin has been handed down to us, and I think it's like the pink hue in the clothes that we see. It is algebraic. We start with this notion, oh, I feel guilty. I feel ashamed. And we apply that when we look at Scripture and theology. In the Reformed tradition, through John Calvin, it is our starting point. It's why Calvin argues that uh, the prayer of confession is central to our worship experience. But what is sin? And what does this tell us about who God is? Because uh, in original sin, it says that God is a God who makes some elect and some reprobate. There are some who are going to be in right relationship with God and there are others who are not. And how we uh, determine this, it's up to God. But what if this notion of original sin, we've gotten off just a little bit. What if there's a different way for us to live in relationship to this doctrine? Most people uh, say that the doctrine of original sin originates in the garden. Eve eats the apple uh, and everyone, forever and for always, is sinful because of that act. Then we turn to uh, chapter 4 and we turn to the story of Cain and Abel, which we're going to read here in a second. And this is how that sin is lived out in the next generation. And then we use it algebraically to say, and we come from that tree, therefore this is uh, why we are sinful. It's handed down through generations. Let's re-examine this text, though. Listen uh, now for the word of the Lord to all of us from Genesis 4. Now the man, Adam, knew his wife, Eve. And she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Next, she bore his brother, Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel, for his part, brought the firstlings of his flock, their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard so Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. I'm going to repeat that line because I want, I want you to know this. The word sin, as we have interpreted it, shows up for the first time in Genesis right there. The word sin has not shown up in the narrative anywhere until right here. Pay attention to where sin is located because we're going to come back. I'm going to read this line. And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain said to his brother Abel, uh, let us go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, hey, uh, where, where's your brother Abel? He said, I do not know. I mean, am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you were cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. You will be a fugitive and wanderer on the earth. 
Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Today you have driven me away from the soil, and I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and wanderer on the earth, and anyone who meets me may kill me. Then the Lord said to him, not so. Whoever kills Cain will suffer a sevenfold vengeance, and the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who came upon him would kill him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What is sin in the text? Sin in the text, in the original Hebrew, is this Hebrew word hata. It shows up 595 other places in the Hebrew scriptures. It is the word that is most used in the original language for the word sin. What does hata mean at its origins? Hata means missing the mark. Missing the mark. Remember this. The second word that we get in the Hebrew scriptures for sin is this word awan, 231 times in the Hebrew uh, language. What does it mean? It means uh, you got it twisted. You got it crooked. You are uh, not in line with what spirit is doing. Third word, pesa. 136 times. This shows up most often when we're talking about religious uh, traditions, when we're talking about uh, if we are following in the ritual correctly, because it means willfully in violation of the law, or you've breached the law. Like, it says that you should kill the fatted calf, then do this. This, Pesa, shows up when it comes to religious ritual, most often. But then in the Greek, uh, we get a couple other words. We get this word, uh, hamartia. It shows up 173 times. It has the same meaning as hata. It means missing the mark. It is the word in the New Testament that is most used to describe this word that we know as sin. So it means missing the mark and its definition, both in the Hebrew and the Greek, is used 768 times in the Bible. 768 times, it means that sin is missing the mark which is really interesting, isn't it? If we understand that sin is missing the mark, it doesn't mean that we weren't capable of hitting the mark. It means we simply missed it. I don't know about you. Anybody ever got lost when you were on a drive? Yeah. Anybody want to admit it publicly, even if you didn't admit it then? Less. Thank you. You can know where you're going, get lost, and still arrive there. Missing the mark as uh, scripture means uh, we are missing the path of what spirit is doing in our lives. It's why the word repentance means what? Someone mumbled it, say it. To turn around. (laughs) Repentance, to repent, means to turn around. So if we understand that sin is missing the mark, oh, uh, there is one path of what God is doing and another path that maybe we want to go down. If we follow that path, we claim that we have gone down the wrong path and we repent in order to what? Turn back to what God is doing so we can be in right relationship with God. So what if sin is less of who is in for eternity and who is out for eternity and much more of am I in the flow of what spirit is doing or am I giving myself over to what is not of God? Am I in the flow of what God is doing in the world or am I giving in to what is not of God? 
What might this look like in practical purposes? It would look like Cain and Abel. Any of you who are signed up for the uh, Going Deeper weekly learning series, you got a foretaste of this uh, in Friday's email blast. There's an ancient midrash. Midrash is a Hebrew word for interpretation. Ancient midrash on Genesis uh, 2, 3, and 4, chapters 2, 3, and 4. And that ancient midrash says, uh, this is a story in Genesis 3, the garden, from children becoming adolescence. It's a story of awakening to your own consciousness and to a world that is bigger than you ever knew. And Genesis 4 is the story of about how adults live out the knowledge that they can choose between good and evil. The Midrash says that Genesis 4 is a story that says, oh, you have been given this freedom. And you are free to choose. But know that those choices have real consequences. They can lead to life. They can also lead to death. So we learn of two brothers. Turns out uh, being in relationship with your family is hard. It's been that way since the beginning. And what happens with Cain? It's not that Cain is not beloved. Cain uh, sees that his brother Abel is somehow special. And it's not, oh, it's not enough for Cain to be beloved. He wants to be special. Let's don't confuse belovedness with favor. That's a sermon series for another day, okay? And I'll just go ahead and preach that sermon now. I don't know. I don't know how any of that works. But what I do know this is this. Cain is not okay with his belovedness, and he wants something more. He wants to feel selfish. Or, I mean, not selfish. He wants to feel special. And in pursuit of that specialness, he becomes selfish. And he misses the mark in not only knowing who he is, but where he is following the divine, and he kills his brother. And when we think we know how this story is going to go, God doesn't condemn Cain forever. Cain condemns himself. He says, how am I going to bear this burden How am I going to walk with this hurt all of my life? Anyone that I encounter now, when they know that I have killed my brother, they will have the right to kill me. And what does God do? God marks Cain. God blesses Cain. Doesn't bless what he has done. But he blesses him and he says, you will be safe. So this story is less about uh, our original sin and much more about a God revealing God's original blessing and showing up to remind us of that blessing and showing up to say, uh, you missing the mark may cry out from the soil. You missing from... You missing the mark may feel like you can't go on, but that is not the end of your story because that is not who you are at your core. Who you are at your core is a beloved child of God. Friends, we do that every time uh, we baptize an infant here at Preston Hollow. We come to this beautiful font, we pour water into it, and there are um, just beautiful parents who then most often hand over an infant to us. And when they hand over uh, that infant, um, I always say, By what name shall that child be baptized? And Reagan, here's what's crazy. I take that child into my arms, and before I baptize them, I don't say, and so um, what do you think they're going to get on their SAT? Who do you think they're going to marry? Where do you think they're going to go to school? How much money do you think they're going to make? You think they're going to actually be president, or you think they're going to get a Nobel Peace Prize? None of that matters in the water. 
Because in the waters of baptism, we affirm this deeper belief that long before we knew who God was, long before we actually could use words to say what our favorite food was or what our parents' real first names were, long before we had that consciousness, God reaches out and claims us as God's own. And we know that there are going to be seasons when we don't miss the mark and we're going to live in right relationship with God. And it's going to feel like we are in the flow. But then we know, right? You've lived long enough to know that there are going to be seasons of our life where we are going to be doing this. That we're going to be missing the mark and we're going to be letting go of God, but it has not changed what? That God has first reached out and claimed us. Friends, what if it's not original sin, but what if it's original blessing? What if that is the thread that has been with you your whole life, like Danielle said last week? What if that is the invitation for us to awaken? How might this good news not just change what you believe? How might that invite you into deeper pathways of belonging? at the office, in your marriage, in your family, your friendships. I have a friend, and uh, she has a younger son. And whenever she would uh, go out of town, her son would get really nervous. He would say, "Uh, Mommy, I'm just scared. I want you to come back. And so every time before she would go out of town, uh, she would sit down with her son and she would say, Mommy's going to leave. And he would say, Mom, but I'm so scared. And she said, but remember, you and I used to be connected by a cord. That's how you had your oxygen. That's how you had your food. But one day we had to cut that cord so that you could come into the world. But even though we cut that cord, there will always be a cord between you and me. We will always be connected no matter where I go, no matter where you go. That cord of belonging is there. And this little boy would say, so even when you're away, that cord is still there? Yes, sweetheart. And even when you come home, yeah, that cord will be there. Friends, uh, from the very beginning, God has looked upon you, (laughs) has looked upon uh, all of us and said, that cord has been there from the very beginning, and it will be there until the very end. And there is nothing you can do (laughs) that would ever break it. So may we rest in that assurance and that good news. Will you pray with me? Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us and mold us and fill us and use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Amen.